Okay. So um, the, the, this last lecture is, uh, I called it uh, Beyond the X boson. Uh, so, and uh, it is about open questions in, in particle physics. Uh, the outline is here, uh, in this slide, so I will um, mention what are the unsolved mysteries that we have now, uh, what are the theories that could go beyond the standard model. I will um, make a, a connection to, co to cosmology uh, and uh, to the relation be between particle physics and, uh, and cosmology. I will talk about uh, dark matter and dark energy and finally uh, some final remarks ob about the what we can still see at LHC. So what are the unsolved mysteries? There are a number of them, many. The standard model answers uh, many questions uh, about the structure of, of, of matter, but it's not uh, a clear, uh, complete uh, uh, theory. So one first question, why do we observe matter and almost no matter in the universe, if we believe that there is a symmetry between matter and antimatter? So we look into the stars and to galaxies and we only see uh, matter. Um, so we could ask why, how do we know that is matter and it's not antimatter? Uh, well, the reason is that if there were big regions of antimatter, they would be in some areas next to the matter. So we would have regions of annihilation between matter and antimatter. And this annihilation would produce uh, photons like I have mentioned that electron positron annihilates and gives to photons so and these photons are not uh, are not observed now other question is what is this dark matter I will uh, refer to you that uh, we can see that uh, visible gravitational effects in cosmos do due to some kind of matter that we don't know what it is so this is another thing that I will comment in this lecture now, another question is to know if quarks and leptons are really fundamental particles or, uh, or if they are made of something else uh, even more fundamental. So re in relation to this uh, previous question is this one, what are the exact nature of these three generations of quarks and, le and, uh, and leptons? So I have a table that replicates, uh, replicates it with copies of quarks and leptons at increasing mass. And uh, today there is no explanation of this pattern of masses that we observed. And uh, there is uh, another very uh, relevant question that is to know how gravity fits in, in all of this. We have no uh, precise idea. So we may, uh, we, so we, we know that the standard model is, is an incomplete theory because there are many questions to be solved. Does this mean that the standard model is wrong? No, the answer is, is no. The standard model is not wrong. And the proof is the agreement that I've showed you between the predictions and the measurements done by many experiments in the last decades. So this agreement at a level of below 1% of uh, accuracy tells us that there is the standard model is essentially uh, right. But we need to go beyond this model in the same way as the Einstein theory of relativity extended Newton's laws of mechanics. So the Newton's laws of mechanics are valid in their domain of application, provided that the speeds of the particles or of the objects that we are dealing with or trying to, ex to describe with Newton laws Relativity is not, uh, it provides this speed is, is small relative to the speed of light. Relativity, relativity is not needed and uh, Newton's laws give a good description. So the same may happen with the standard model. It is good, it is applicable at the level of energies that we have today in accelerators. But for, if we go to higher energies, we need uh, probably something else. Now, one of the big problems is that we have now is related to the Higgs mass itself. Uh, and uh, this problem is known as the hierarchy problem. So, in uh, quantum theory, uh, the fluctuations, 
So I have here the x, and this x that is represented by this line, think that the x is um, traveling in this direction. At some point, he may give this fluctuation. So this is a pair of uh, uh, a fermion and antifermion, and then it comes back again to the to the x. So I have already mentioned this type of virtual process of this quantum fluctuation several times. This type of process appears in the theory, in the computation of the X mass. And when uh, we get the X mass, so you see it here, that is the, uh, the X mass uh, squared, for some reason, and it's the X, what we call the bare mass, the uh, MH0, and then there is a series of terms that appear out of this calculation, terms of this form. Some terms are negative, other terms are positive. So this is a, a, a big series of terms. Correspond, each term corresponding to one of these graphs of these corrections. And there are many types of, types of graphs, graphs more complicated, different particles in the loop, uh, etc. And this, um, uh, this, each one of these terms depends on two constants here. This lambda, that is the coupling of the x to this type of fermion that is in this loop, that is a finite number. And this lambda, this here, and this lambda is the scale up to which this theory is valid. So if there is nothing else, if this theory is up to lambda, is valid up to the energy lambda, I know that this virtual particle here can go up to that energy without any problem and this process is valid. So what we have is to, in mathematical terms, integrate all the energies of this particle in this loop. And that's where this lambda comes from. This lambda, if there is nothing else than the standard model, can be as high as the Planck scale, that is 10 to the 19th GeV. Because the Planck scale is, say, a limit, is the, the, the scale at which gravity starts to play. So we know that at least at that level, when gravity starts to play a role uh, at, at, at the level of these microparticles, something in the theory should happen to describe gravity. So the problem is then that I have these terms that are huge, because this is 10 to the 19. The mass of the X is 10 to the square is 125, so it's 10 to the square GV. And this is 10 to the 19, so it's huge orders of magnitudes larger. So how, ca how can be that this number here comes out to be so small, 125? For that to happen, I have to have this term that is negative cancelling with a positive term. So if I have a big negative number and a big positive number, I sum the two and I may have a residue that is very small. But, but to be f for this to be possible, we have to, b to do what we call fine-tuning, that is to adjust the parameters of the, the nature and uh, the parameters of the model and of the theory, these lambdas and so on, such that this cancellation occurs. And these miraculous cancellations are therefore needed to keep the X mass below 1 TeV. So, this is, this is known as the hierarchy problem. We need these miraculous constellations and, and we are not very happy with this. So we are, what we would like would be a natural explanation for the fact that the X mass is small, something that cancels these terms naturally. I will come back to that later. Now the problem of the three generations that I already mentioned. So the problem is that these generations, so this is the first, quarks UED that makes the nuclear matter the neutrino and the electron, and this is the everyday world. And now I have these are the second family, quarks C and S, then the top and bottom quarks, and here I have the leptons mu and tau. All these objects, the electron is half uh, MeV, the muon is 100 MeV, and the tau is 1.8 GeV. And uh, this is a few hundred MeV, this is 1.5 GeV, and this is 173 GeV. We do not know why there are three, fam three generations and we have no idea of an explanation for the observed mass pattern. Now, what are neutrinos telling us? 
Neutrinos are the most mysterious of the known particles in the universe. So they, they interact very weakly. There are trillions of them crossing our bodies and uh, without uh, doing nothing, leaving any trace. The, the neutrinos, I showed it in the previous table, they exist in three species. So the neutrino of the electron, the neutrino of the muon, and the neutrino of the tau. And uh, what happens is that neutrinos from one generation mysteriously transform into neutrinos of the two other generations. When they travel, they start in the sun as neutrinos of the electron, and when they arrive at Earth, we measure them, and they are already neutrinos of the muon or neutrinos of the tau. So, and this phenomenon has been observed in several experiments, experiments done with neutrino beams, where we know exactly that we are sending there neutrinos of the muon. And then we go and measure and we find neutrinos of the electron. So why they and how they transform in, uh, in from one species to another, we don't know. But we know that, that, that they should have mass, because otherwise they these transformations would not have not be possible at all. So they should have a small a, a mass to make these transformations possible. However, the, the experiments that have been done show that the heaviest neutrinos is at least a million times lighter than the lightest charged particle that is the electron. So no idea why now I have neutrinos with a very, very small mass. So many people believe that neutrinos will lead us towards the discovery of new physics. And, uh, and there are a number of experiments being prepared um, in several places in the world, in particular in the US and in Japan, to have new neutrino beams and to make experiments with neutrinos. Now, what happened? So I mentioned the problem of the antimatter. What happened to the antimatter? Uh, antimatter. So we know that uh, we have this uh, symmetry for e every fundamental particle that exists in an antiparticle. At the Big Bang, if this symmetry is fundamental, when the matter was created, certainly uh, a similar, uh, uh, the same number, equal number of particle and antiparticles was produced. So what happened to the antimatter then that was produced in the Big Bang? So the idea is that, well, somehow, at some point, an imbalance between matter and antimatter was established, was generated early in the evolution of the universe. Afterwards, matter annihilated with antimatter, but because of this unbalance that, that was somehow generated by some mechanism, that remains a small excess of matter. So we produced 10 for the, the ratio is about 1 in 10 to the 9 of uh, the particles and antiparticles produced survived after the annihilation of matter and antimatter. And this is this, this small ex excess that now makes the stars, galaxies, and so on. So there is a subtle asymmetries. There are s subtle asymmetries between matter and antimatter that were observed experimentally. So in some processes, we see different probabilities, if you want, of produce, producing matter and antimatter. This is a, a thing that um, is known technically by the name of CP violation. This CP violation, however, is insufficient to account for the observed matter domination. So there is, uh, quantitatively, uh, it doesn't work very well. Okay, dark matter. Um, so the majority of the universe may, may be made of some type of matter, uh, uh, some type may not be made of, some t of, uh, of the same type of matter as in the Earth. Uh, and this we infer from gravitational effects that I will comment in a minute. And uh, uh, there is strong uh, evidence that this matter is are not protons, neutrons, or electrons. So uh, there is some matter out there that we don't know what it is, and there is also this dark energy. So we, we, we know that stars and other visible uh, matter, like intergalactical gas, uh, account for about 4% of total uh, matter and energy in the universe. And uh, so there is this issue, what are the other 96%? And so the 
the accounting today is to say that there are 22% of dark matter, the thing that has to do with the gravitational effects that I've mentioned, and is 74% of dark energy that is, has to do with uh, the expansion, the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. I will come to that as well. So the theories behind the standard model, there are many. There are many, and um, I will uh, comment some of, some of them. One is this uh, idea of grand unified theory. So we have unified electromagnetism with weak force. And we have uh, the strong force that is, called th that is described by a theory named chromodynamics. Uh, is the, th the theory of quarks and gluons. And this uh, quantum chromodynamics, or QCD for short, is described by the, s mathematic by the same type of mathematics that describes the other electroweak uh, part. So there is the hope that we can make a bridge between these two and identify a theory, a mathematical uh, uh, construction that can describe at the same time the electroweak and the strong force. This is known as the grand unified theory. And uh, so I made here a comment that Einstein, had in the last uh, part of his life, tried to attempt to unify gravity and uh, electromagnetism, he failed. And, uh, well, it's so hard that nobody yet uh, tried to achieve that. So now, the point uh, in this unification is that uh, if we look to the fundamental forces that we are now trying to un unify in this grand unif unification are these uh, three. And we see that uh, this is the strength. The, s the relative strength between the forces is very different. So if I put one for the strong force as, uh, uh, in some units, then the weak force is 10 to the minus 6, and the electromagnetic force is 10 to the minus 2. This at the scale of the relative decays, of the scale of the nuclei for the strong force, and at the scale of atoms and molecules for the electromagnetic force. Very well. So the question is, how can we unify theory, uh, forces that uh, have so different nature and so different uh, strengths? Now, one point about these, the, 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 the strengths is that the strength of the interaction is proportional to the charge that uh, is responsible for the interaction. The strength of the electro, electromagnetic uh, uh, field and interaction depends on the charge of the electron, so, uh, the, the electric charge. The, the strength of the strong interaction depends of another type of charge that is called color charge. Color because of some analogy with the true color that uh, in fact has nothing to do with the true color. So uh, the point is that these uh, charges, the measurement of the, the, these charges are not constant. They depend on the energy at which the particle is considered. So here there is a graph that shows how the, so the vertical axis, the strength of the force or the charge related to that force. And here is how it evolves when we go from the energies that where we are now today, working in accelerators, to much higher energies. So this is in GeV. So we are, LHC is more or less here at this level. And uh, this is 10 to the 16 or so GeV. So, and we know, we, have, we measure today this uh, is charge of the strong interaction and we see that it depends on the energy. So we measure here a few points and uh, the it decreases indeed. And uh, the, the same thing for the electromagnetic and the weak uh, charges. So this is both an, is both, uh, an, an, ex uh, an experimental result and a theoretical insight uh, that goes into the, into the same direction. So one way to understand why the charge uh, changes with energy is uh, this mechanism of vacuum polarization. Imagine that you have here an electrical charge, this Q, an electron, for example. And we know that the vacuum, in the vacuum, are all the time popping up pairs electron-positron, so plus-minus charges that then annihilate. And so there's uh, these quantum fluctuations of the vacuum. Now, these pairs of uh, electron-positron, they align uh, because of the electrical field created by this uh, uh, central charge, 
and create here a, a cloud of, uh, of pairs of charge that in some way screens the charge of this electron when I look from far away. But if, I'm look, if I look closer and if I go behind, beyond this screen, I, I see an increased, uh, uh, a larger charge for the electron. This is what you see here. The, uh, this electromagnetic charge is increasing with energy because in energy is distance. The higher the energy, remember, energy of a particle is a smaller wavelength of the wave that is associated to this particle. The smaller the wavelength, the closer I can come to this, uh, to this object. So there is an inverse relation between uh, distance and, uh, and energy. So the, the, the chart of the unification of forces is this one. Uh, considering here all the, all the forces from the mechanical the forces and, and magnetism, electricity and so on. So I have comment already this part of the, we have discussed about the unification of uh, electromagnetism and weak force, the electro weak theory. This here is quantum chromodynamics describing the nuclear forces and what I've been now talking about is this grand unifying theory here. So we went a, a long way from here up to, to this point already. So we have just to go this last bit. And this uh, direction here is a direction of increasing energy. So maybe we have this grand unified theory and maybe there is a way to combine these three interactions here with gravitation that we call here quantum gravity, but we have no good theories for that. Now this chart of unification of the forces, this also can be seen also as a chart of the universe, of the expansion of the universe. So here is the Big Bang and here is time. So 10 minus 43 seconds after the Big Bang, 10 minus 35 seconds and today 10 to the 17 seconds. So, and what we know is that during this this period here is very, very short period. So here is one microsecond after the Big Bang. The temperature of the universe decreases, decreased quite a lot. And up to now, it's uh, three uh, Kelvin. So if we take as reference the, the, the energy of the cosmic uh, background radiation. Now, there is a relation between energy and, and temperature, but it's, it's enough to multiply by this constant. That is the, it's the Boltzmann constant, so you multiply by, by this and you get the, ener the, the corresponding energy. And if you make this, this computation, we see that LHC is here. The energy of the LHC is at this point. So that means we are at the point where you can see the unification of the electromagnetic force and weak force. And indeed, we have discovered the X, that is the sign that we have discovered this unification. Now we have to go still, to go to this point where the unification uh, with the strong interaction occurs, we have to go some, ten, or some uh, 10 orders of magnitude, yes. So it's quite a lot. So it's not for tomorrow, at least in terms of accelerators. And for gravity is even worse. So, uh, well, this is where we are in terms of, um, of the, so this uh, unification energy uh, the, the why we also talk so much about this, uh, this unification is because we believe that in the same way that uh, uh, at the electroweak scale, the electromagnetism and the weak force become of similar intensity, become two aspects of the same thing, uh, we believe that the same will, uh, will happen at unification energy at 10 to the 16 GV with a strong force. And, uh, and we know, or we say, that this, this symmetry is broken at lower energies to give different masses and, force and the, the strengths that we see. The example of this that may help you to understand, consider a liquid. A liquid and I say, may have another state that is uh, uh, ice, so it can freeze. And let me consider the liquid, the high temperature, and the, the ice, the low temperature. So. Liquid is symmetric. It looks the same in all directions. I take a liquid and it looks the same in all directions. But now I decrease the temperature, as in the universe, the decrease the temperature, and the liquid freezes, gives ice, it, and the thing loses symmetry because we have crystals that are formed 
with preferred direction. So the crystals have. So uh, a similar thing is uh, would happen to these interactions when they freeze and manifest as different different uh, interactions. Um, well, there are uh, th theories that try this uh, grand unification. One of them is labeled uh, SU5, that is the group of symmetry that is associated with this unification. Don't worry too much about that now. But there, are, there, there is an increase, increased number of gauge bosons in this theory, 24 in total, 12 that we have now already, gluons, uh, photons, and Ws and Zs, and 12, additional 12. These objects would be uh, responsible mediating another a new interaction, and, and they are called, these new objects, they are called leptoquarks, because they would allow transitions from quarks to leptons, and uh, with a very important consequence. If this happens, if this transition from lepton to quarks, uh, and vice versa, epton, then, then the proton is unstable. That means that the proton that forms uh, our galaxies and so on, at some point, uh, in, uh, would uh, decay and matter will disappear, at least as we, we know. Uh, however, taking this uh, simplest model of the Grand Unified Theory, we can calculate the proton lifetime, making some assumptions that I'm not going to comment, but, uh, uh, and, and the, the prediction comes out to be between uh, 10 to the 28 and 10 to the 30 years. So this indicates two things. First is that the precision the, of the, this prediction is not very high and this has to do with the assumptions that we make that, so we, that are not very precise. But the second thing is that this proton lifetime is huge, is much larger than the age of the universe. So there is no danger. So even if uh, the proton decays, there is no danger. But it is also, it tells also that how difficult it is to measure this proton lifetime. Because to measure the proton lifetime, to I have to see protons decaying. And to see protons decaying, uh, I have to wait, uh, I cannot wait 10 to the 30, 30 years, so I have to have many protons. So I have to have a big block of matter, many, many, many tons, to have detectors embedded in this, in this uh, uh, matter, and see if some proton decays and gives a signal. And uh, this is done. There are many detectors that were installed in caverns, in uh, mines, uh, because you have to be protected from the cosmic radiation that could give signals in your det detector mimicking the proton decay. So um <coughs> this was done. and. The Current measurements give values of uh, lifetime that are 10 to the 31, 10 to the 32, so much higher than the prediction from the models. And uh, so people now try other models, uh, more complicated, and, uh, but the issue is, of course, not yet settled. So it's something that is underway. Now, another theory that has many, many people uh, working on it, many physicists dedicated their lifetime to develop these theories of uh, supersymmetry, and this would be a f another fundamental symmetry in nature. Like there is this, this symmetry between particle and antiparticle, there would be a symmetry between uh, bosons and fermions. And, uh, for every fundamental ma matter uh, particle, quarks and so on, there would be a massive shadow force carrier particle, so uh, a particle of, of spin one. And for each force carrier, W, Z, etc., of spin one, there would be a shadow matter pa particle of spin one half. So you can Im see this as having here the, the particles that you know of the standard model, and here, in s with some reflection or some uh, symmetry operation, these partners that should be much heavier, that's why these balls here are bigger than the normal particles. Um, <coughs> so this relation between these uh, uh, matter particles and force pa carriers, that means between uh, fermions and bosons, is uh, called SUSY for short. 
And uh, it's uh, uh, an object of searches in the, in the colliders, uh, in the collider experiments, looking for some, for the production of these objects as the X was, was produced. So we believe, we know that these particles are, have a mass that is above some limit, because otherwise they have been discovered already in previous accelerators. But uh, up to now, we have not yet seen these, uh, these particles. So um, in another way to look at this is that we have this, uh, the table of uh, the constituents would be doubled. So this is the standard model. And here is the mirror supersymmetric world, where, where I have these particles with the tilde represent the, super the supersymmetric uh, version or, uh, of the particle. So we know that this symmetry is broken because otherwise the particle and, and supersymmetric particle would have the same, the same mass, but this is the same, the same type of problem that you have with electroweak symmetry breaking, and we have already discovered a mechanism that spontaneously makes that uh, breaking of symmetry. So this is not a problem. So what are the issues that supersymmetry would solve? The first one is this unification. So I have told you that, well, the strengths of the interactions extrapolating to higher energies, they converge to the same point, not quite. In the standard model, they do not converge to the same point, more or less. So if I'm not so precise, I say that yes, but, but it, when we do the same thing, considering SUSY, adding to the standard model the SUSY particles, the convergence is quasi perfect. So this is really quite astonishing. Now the second thing that uh, Susie does is to bring a solution to, the X, to this X mass problem, to the hierarchy problem. So I told you about these terms that are used that should be cancelled, these big cancellations and so on. And now if I add supersymmetry, I add other corrections where in these loops I have supersymmetric particles. So, and here I have a loop with a given fermion, say the top quark. And here I have a similar loop with the stop quark. We say stop because we put an S of supersymmetry. So the top becomes the stop. And the electron becomes the selectron. That is a, a strange word. So, and what happens is that I get t terms, a term that is, was the one corresponding to this diagram, that is this one, and a similar term corresponding to that diagram here that is identical except that it has a plus sinus because the spin of this particle, because this is a boson and this is a fermion. And the fact that one is a fermion and another a boson makes that the sign of these terms is, uh, is uh, symmetric. So these terms cancel. So these big terms cancel naturally without any fine tuning and so on. So this is a reason why people like uh, one important reason why people like uh, supersymmetry. Now, however, uh, this uh, supersymmetry gives other type of terms that are here indicated uh, that depend on the logarithm of this Planck scale, of this lambda. So this means that these terms grow very slowly with, with energy, but, ne but nevertheless, they become uh, a problem if this, this uh, scales, this mass of the supersymmetric particles is above 1 or 2 TeV because then I start having the same problem of cancellation but not at the level of the standard model, now at the level of supersymmetry. So we are convinced that if supersymmetry exists and if it, if it solves this problem of this hierarchy problem, the particles have to be, the supersymmetric particles have to be with mass 1 or 2 TeV, not, not too much, not above. Okay, now another type of theories that, uh, that people are pursuing are these extra dimensions. So space-time could have more than three space dimensions. And uh, these extra dimensions could be very, very small and uh, would remain undetected until now. Now, uh, how can there be extra smaller dimensions? One way to understand this is these examples. So this acrobat can move forward and backward along the rope. So he has here in this, walking on this rope, and he can move in one dimension. He has just one dimension of movement. But this flea here can move also 
forward and backward, but also side to side. So for, for this small bug here, you have two dimensions. The, the issue is that the second dimension is rolled up, in a, is closed in a loop. So if we extrapolate this for the space of three dimensions or four, we, I can have then a fourth and a fifth dimension in curved, di curved, uh, in curved space, closed in a loop, like in this example, uh, in, two, in two dimensions. Why people have introduced this? Because this is a way, what is the, the motivation, the original motivation is to explain why gravity is so much weaker than all the other interactions. And um, so we know that it's uh, much weaker, the Planck scale is very high, that means that this uh, gravitation constant here in this Newton law is very small in comparison with the electroweak scale. Now the, ish, the idea is that if there are more than three spatial dimensions and then only gravity can operate in those uh, extra rolled up dimensions, the Planck scale could be much smaller of the order of the electroweak scale. So the idea is that you have lines of force, so lines of uh, force of the gravity that instead of going away in three dimensions, they can go away also in the other dimensions. So that means that this makes the strength of the interaction in our physical space of three dimensions much, uh, very, very small. So this is the idea of this, uh, of this thing. And uh, now th there were uh, recently developments of people considering if extra dimensions of uh, size uh, of uh, very of a size accessible at LHC, so of the order of 10 to the minus one. That means distance of the order of 10 to the minus 19 meter, and allowing other particles, not only gravity, to propagate in these extra dimensions. And this would, get, would give what we call kaluza klein towers of states of increases masses because this would be correspond to particle excitations in extra dimensions. So the particles could have the kind of vibrations in the other dimensions that would give uh, states of higher energy. So this would give in the accelerators copies of the, for example, co copies of the standard model gauge bosons like the FE. A Z boson, we called it Z prime. So, and there were a number of people looking, searching for at LHC for Z primes. Now, finally, a word about the string theory that many of you have heard about. Uh, this is an attempt to unify in a single theory quantum mechanics, relativity, and gravity. So, quantum mechanics and relativity, special relativity, are unified in Dirac equation and so on. I've talked about that. But uh, general relativity that explains gravity at the macroscopic scale has no, today has no description at the quantum level, uh, at the level of, of particles. So, there is no quantum mechanic version of gravity. And string theory is an attempt to do that. Um, <coughs> So uh, string, uh, string theory uh, proposes indeed a world with uh, more than three dimensions uh, and some versions have 11 dimensions of space and uh, uh, the replacing the point, uh, the point particles by strings or even membranes uh, vibrating in these extra dimensions. And uh, these vibrations would correspond different uh, modes of vibration of the strings in the extra dimensions would correspond to the particles that we observed in the standard model table. Uh, this is uh, the, the hope. Uh, unfortunately, after many, many years, well, already mm, quite some number of years of work in string theories by, by a considerable number of uh, physicists, there are not yet uh, precise predictions from, from it that we could confront with experiment. Okay, so moving to the uh, next stop, that is the, cos the connection to cosmology. So I will go fast here because uh, Seth already covered some of this in his, uh, in his lecture, I remember yesterday or the day before. Uh, so uh, you know now that we have, this, we have this big bang, we have the universe expanding um, and uh, the LHC tries to recreate conditions uh, 
uh, at, uh, at some point here in the a few uh, interval of time after the Big Bang. And this, uh, in this uh, slide, two slides, I try to describe the, the various st stages of evolution of the universe. So here we have the Big Bang. At the time of 10 to the minus four uh, 43, we the, the universe undergoes goes through a super fast inflation. So you have already heard about that. Then we have the uh, end of inflation. We have quarks and leptons, matter and antimatter symmetry. And uh, at this point starts the decoupling between the strong and the electroweak forces that were unified before that, that point. Then at 10 to the minus 10 uh, is the electroweak era, the thing that we are now probing at LHC. At that point, we have already an excess of matter of, uh, or over antimatter. So matter is already annihilated with antimatter leaving this excess. So whatever physics justifies this, we, th we think it's beyond that to the, the point of uh, electroweak unification. And so at this point, we have the decoupling of electromagnetic and weak forces. Then later, at 10 to the minus 4 seconds, we have protons and neutrons. So the quarks combine to make uh, protons and neutrons. And uh, uh, you may ask, why this doesn't happen before? Well, it doesn't happen before because uh, they, in particular case of quarks and, and gluons, because they are in a state of matter that w is measured also, in, has been measured in the accelerators that we call the quark-gluon plasma. So it's, it's a plasma, uh, a gas of quarks and gluons where the density is so high that you cannot form hadrons. They cannot hadronize, they cannot combine in these groups of three or pairs quark and antiquark. So, um, but when the expansion continues and the temperature uh, goes below a given threshold, uh, these protons and uh, neutrons can be, can be f created. Then, uh, at this point, 10 to the t uh, 100 seconds, so it's, this is three minutes, um, there is the famous book from by Stefan Weinberg, The First Three Minutes of the Universe, where he describes uh, these things in quite some detail and uh, in an accessible way. It's a very, bo very good book that I recommend. So at this point, nuclei are created. So protons and neutrons combine to make helium nuclear. And... Um, that is the most stable nucleus that you can create at this point, and that is uh, very abundant now in the universe, and uh, this abundance fits very well with the predictions of this Big Bang theory. Now, what we have now, we have these nuclei, and we have electrons and neutrinos flying around, and this continues up during 380,000 uh, years, at which point the, the energy is low enough to make atoms stable. That means that before that, atoms form, but then there is an electron that comes, collides with that atom, and destroys the atom. So they do not remain stably. Below a given level of energy, uh, the energy is r sufficiently low to, to keep, uh, such that the atoms can, can keep uh, its stability. So they, they form atoms, and at this point, the universe becomes transparent, transparent to light. It means before, if I have charged particles, the photons uh, interact uh, with, uh, uh, with charged particles, and so they, they interact uh, uh, very rapidly, so they cannot propagate uh, uh, without interacting. Once uh, the atoms in is formed, are formed, the matter, all these components are neutral, they have no charge, atoms have no charge, so the light can, can go through without problems. So, and then we have, uh, at, uh, we have galaxies and, uh, and we have humans uh, after that. Okay, so these are the various stages of the Big Bang. To measure the cosmos, so this I will uh, skip because uh, it was already covered by Seth, so we have the standard candles to, to measure distances and we have red shifts the measurement of the redshift uh, of the emitted light to uh, measure speed. And uh, m doing these measurements, Hubble succeeded to establish this correlation between distance to galaxy and velocity. That was the clear indication that uh, the space is expanding. And then uh, there was the discovery of the co cosmic microwave background 
uh, by Penzias and Wilson in 64, and uh, so this is a remaining uh, a background of photons, radiation that comes from this point where the, when the universe became transparent, so the, the photons that at that point became free, no, no interaction with the atoms, and so they, they remain there. And, um, uh, and they have been propagating uh, since ever, and today we can detect them in this big uh, type of big antennas. Um, because uh, the, and this, this uh, radiation is uh, a black body as radiation, so it has the spectrum of, uh, of a black, uh, black body. Um, I will come to that uh, in, a minute in, in the next slide, but before that, so uh, these photons uh, at uh, an energy that, that, is, that was uh, much higher, 1,000 times higher than they, are, than they have today, and this is because the space expansion stretches the photons, so the wavelengths of the photon becomes larger, uh, and their energy lower, and this is called the cosmological redshift. So the factor of stretching uh, uh, from th there until now is uh, of the order of 1,000. Now, uh, this radiation is a black, uh, f as a spectrum of a black body. So a black body is a, a body that is in thermal equilibrium as at a given temperature. So it's a, a body, a piece of matter that is in equilibrium at a given temperature T, or whatever the temperature it is, emits radiation. And this radiation has a given spectrum as a function of the frequency of, of the radiation. Uh, so and this spectrum is called the black body uh, spectrum. It was introduced by uh, Max Planck in, uh, in 1900. Uh, um, and uh, the, the, the equation that represents this, uh, this spectrum is this one. It, uh, you see it just depends on the temperature. And uh, it's very interesting to notice that this was at the origin of the quanta, uh, the photon introduced by Einstein. Because Planck, to, uh, to arrive to this equation, he had to assume that the energy in the electromagnetic field was quantified but he was not, uh, didn't have the courage, I don't know, or didn't thought about that, to propose the idea of quantum of energy that uh, later on Einstein introduced. Um, so this radiation now, so it's, as this spectrum, it has a, a, a wavelengths in the, in the microwave uh, uh, regime, so I've, uh, I've put here the, so the, the frequency of the radiation is also of the order of 160 gigahertz and wavelengths of the order of 2 millimeters. And this can be then captured by antennas. And uh, when we measure this radiation, we see that the temperature that we extract from fitting this curve to the data so with this equation gives a temperature of 2.728 grams Kelvin. And it is very uniform. So this is the sky map. This is was obtained by a satellite named COBE in 92. It's very uniform. Now, if you look, you take the average of this, and uh, you subtract the average, then you see that it remains a delta, t a delta T of the order of 3 millikelvin, very, very small, and with the structure of a dipole. And this results from the fact that we are moving so our, we are, uh, the Earth, the, the solar system is moving uh, in a certain direction and, uh, and due to this movement, some of the photon, photons that come from us in the, same, in, the, in the opposite direction, they have a higher frequency than the others and so this makes this small, uh, this dipole structure. Now I subtract this, this, this structure and what remains, it, rem it remains this. So it remain, there, are, there are fluctuations of micro Kelvin, so 18 micro Kelvin. So we are at the level of 10 to the minus 5 in fluctuation. So these measurements are really very precise. It's astonishing. And I see here this band. This is radiation that comes from the galaxy. So it's not uh, what concerns us. What concerns us now is, is the, are there these other fluctuations? What is the origin of these other fluctuations? So uh, Kob uh, in, uh, was uh, measuring these things in 92, and then in 2000, there are more precise measurements from WMAP uh, satellite. 
and uh, this brought a, a kind of a revolution to cosmology, if you want. So there we have these great observatories in space, uh, not only measuring this cosmic background radiation, but also other type of radiations, X-rays, gammas, and so on. There are large telescopes on Earth that have been built in the past uh, two or three decades, I don't know exactly. Surveys of the sky, measurement of uh, millions of galaxies. So now we can measure all these galaxies and make maps of the sky, and we see that the universe has, has these, uh, these large structures that, um, that are very, very interesting. So this is to say that cosmology is really, in the, in the past 20 years, went through a kind of a phase transition. Now, mar dark matter. So this is an information that comes from cosmology, and it is very, very important for particle physics, because we try to, to <laughs> we claim that we, our field is to describe the, co to describe the constituents of matter, and now these guys from cosmology uh, come and say, well, but you just succeed to explain 4% uh, of it. So it's disappointing. So how do they did that? Well, so they looked back in time, it's look far away to the stars. Stars in the constellation of Andromeda are at uh, between 50 and 500 years, but if you look more close with binoculars, you can see this nebula, and this nebula is the a galaxy named Andromeda, and um, it's uh, at a distance of two million years. Uh, uh, so the light took uh, two million years to, to come to us. And uh, they start measuring this, uh, this thing. And, uh, and they find out, found out they measured the orbiting speeds of the stars in this galaxy. So this galaxy has some rotation. See, the, 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 the stars rotate in this galaxy. And uh, and uh, Vera Rubin published at some point uh, uh, a paper about these measurements. Now, the point is that the speed of an orbiting star measures the total mass of everything inside the orbit. So this is the main point. Measuring the speed of rotation of a star is the same as measuring the mass inside the orbit. So this we know since Newton. Since Newton, we know that um, that uh, uh, further away from the orbit center, the orbit uh, speed is slower, and that the orbit speed measures the mass. If I have a sun that is more massive, the speed would be higher. So, what they did is to measure, to count, to measure light, and from light to extrapolate to mass, because we know that these light are stars, and uh, the stars, they, they know the type of stars that, uh, that are in the, the galaxies. I don't know all these details. But the important thing is that you can come to a mass distribution of the visible light. And now you measure, as a function of the distance to the center of the galaxy, this distance here, you measure the speed of rotation. And according to the mass that you have in the visible light, you would expect the speed to go like this. That means it goes up, and then for stars that are farther away, they start to, to have lower speeds. This is Newton's mechanics. Now, the measurement is this. So the only possibility for the stars to have this speed remaining attracted to bound it to the galaxy and not flying away by the cent centrifugal force is that there is more mass here. And this more mass is what we call the dark matter. So what is the dark matter? What is that? Well, since uh, 40 years we are trying to answer that question and still have no answer. So there is something else that we don't know what it is. Could it be Susie particles? So this is another reason that many people like supersymmetry. So I told you in s we have these uh, standard model particles, the photon, Ws, gluons, uh, X boson, and the corresponding supersymmetric particles have these strange names, Fotino, Vino, Zino, Gluino, Xino. And these Inus <laughs> are the prime suspects to be the galactical dark matter. So they are uh, weakly interacting particles. They are massive. Uh, so they, they are bounded by gravity. Uh, they are 
weekly interactives, that means that uh, that's why we have not yet seen them here on Earth, because they, they cross like neutrinos and we don't see them. And, uh, but they have mass and so they, they participate in gravity and they, uh, they explain this rotation of uh, stars in the, in, the, in the galaxies. Now the other issue is dark energy. <coughs> Uh, so Einstein uh, introduced uh, general relativity, that is a uh, theory of, uh, of gravity, the presence of mass and energy determines the geometry of space, this is what the theory says, and, the, and on the other hand, the geometry of space determines the motion of mass and energy. Uh, so if it is so, then mat matter and energy, the matter and energy content of the universe deter determines its evolution. Uh, so these are the, cosmo the, the Einstein equations in a very simplified form and uh, so this is uh, the geometry of space, this G here, this tensor here is the geometry of space. It can be curved, it can be linear, but uh, it's described by this uh, piece here and this is matter in energy, is this T here and uh, there is a relation between the geometry of the space and uh, the density of matter and energy. And Einstein introduced at some point this constant that is known as the cosmological constant to maintain the universe stable, stationary. So uh, if you have, an, at that point there was no expansion, so it was not known. Uh, if you have uh, all this matter and energy, the universe tends to collapse because gravity so he introduced something that has the opposite effect. So it is a kind of anti-gravity. This, this is the effect of this cosmological constant. It's a kind of a positive energy density that is, is o overall the, the, the space. Uh, so the cosmological constant has the same effect of an intrinsic energy density of the vacuum. So and uh, it can be shown that a positive vacuum energy density implies a negative pressure and an accelerated expansion. Um, so there are relatively easy ways to, to, to be convinced that, that uh, this is so. Uh, so take from here the message that if we have the positive vacuum energy density, then uh, everything behaves as, uh, as uh, the universe, as, as a kind of force, of anti-gravitical force, uh, that uh, accelerates the expansion. <coughs> now, cosmological mo models were introduced a long time ago, uh, starting with Friedman in uh, 22 and then Lemaitre in 27. There is here a concept for th in this evolution of the universe that is the critical energy density. Uh, and uh, if the density of the universe is above this density, then it is, expand it, uh, is, above then it is expanding and then will recollapse. So the energy density is sufficiently enough so that at, at some point after the expansion, gravity brings everything together. Or if it is lower than the critical value, it will expand forever. What I'm showing this plot here, so this is time and this is the relative distance between two points in the universe. So that, that characterizes the expansion. I'm putting this here because the rate we can measure, I will show you that with cosmic background radiation, we can measure this expansion, how this expansion goes, if it goes through this curve or through that one or through that one. So that means that we can have a measurement of the density of this omega. This omega is the the density of the universe divided by the critical energy, the critical density. So, and with those measurements that I will comment in a moment, we know now that our universe has an omega close to one. We are very close to the critical density. Why? We have to get eventually an explanation from that. So, WMAP made, made these measurements of the cosmic uh, uh, background. Uh, with already here the galaxy subtracted and uh, we see these fluctuations. So when it is blue, it is uh, less energy. When it is red, it is high energy or vice versa. To be honest, I don't know. And uh, they studied these, uh, these, uh, 
they, they looked at these fluctuations, so this, this, to par the pattern of these fluctuations. What they were trying to do is to establish correlations between the, f the fluctuation at this point and at uh, some distance, looking to a given distance and see how it correlates, and then to a smaller distance and or, or to a larger distance, to look to patterns of these correlations. And they, um, why? Because um, it is, it believe that in the early universe there were fluctuations in the universe. There, there are, if the universe is, is uh, in the initial phase of expansion, even during inflation, you have quantum fluctuations. And these quantum fluctuations may create regions of higher density and regions of lower density. And matter and radiation fall to these densest spots. So and that means that in the universe there is a kind of waves, sound waves, um, that could be now seen as temperature, as fluctuations in this, uh, in the temperature of the cosmic, uh, cosmic microwave background. And so, and measuring these correlations is like trying to measure these wavelengths of these uh, long uh, sound waves, these fluctuations here. And, uh, and uh, doing that, we know that doing that, we can estimate what was what was the, the size of the horizon at the time of the cosmic uh, microwave background? Because this background is thermalized, so, and the longest wave, that, the longest correlation that you can have uh, between two points in this thing uh, gives the size of this uh, physical, uh, of the horizon at that time. And so, extrapolate, comparing this, this observed angular size of the CM, uh, CMB fluctuations, we can uh, uh, sorry, compa comparing this, the size of the, of the horizon at the time of the cosmic microwave background with this other size that I obtained from CMB, I deduce this omega equal one. So, um, even my, I didn't work on that, so I'm not an expert on this. Take as a, but, but I take the, the message that I take from here is that today, f from these very precise measurements, uh, with very precise instruments, uh, I can have this data and a fit to the data that is given by this model of the inflation, so the, the line describes I exactly these points, uh, and from that I can extract a number of things, in particular the density of matter and energy, and the value that comes out is very close to one. So this is uh, impressive, in my, in my opinion. Now, why the energy, uh, mat energy density of the universe is close to one? So this was already introduced by Seth, so it's this uh, model of cosmic inflation. Uh, at the early stage, the, 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 the universe undergoes a very fast e expansion of a factor 10 to the 50, and uh, uh, this uh, it has two effects. The first effect is to solve this problem of flatness, of the problem of uh, density being uh, uh, equal to one, r the relative density being equal to one. Uh, so, uh, because we know that uh, there is a correspondence between geometry and, and density. The density equal to one means a flat universe. A density much larger than one me means a curved universe in a, in a round uh, sphere and uh, uh, less than one means uh, divergent curvature. So imagine that this is the universe before the inflation, a very small bubble, m eventually the space very curved. Uh, and this is the region that we see today. And now we apply an expansion factor of 10 to the 50, that is a huge factor, and this, this uh, sphere becomes much larger and we are here just looking to a small piece of this sphere and of course if you look just in this region the space appears flat, it appears to be flat. Okay, so this is the first problem that is solved by, by uh, the inflation. The second problem is this problem why that uh, set already discussed, why this temperature is thermalized, why how this point here knows what is the temperature and transmits this information to this other spot. Why these two spots have the same, the same temperature? Because these two points at the time of 
uh, when the, the photons became decoupled from matter, they were not connected by, uh, could not be connected by signals transmitted at the speed of light. So uh, the answer to this uh, question is that uh, the thermalization occurred much before, it occurred before the inflation, the thermal equilibrium was established then, and then the is the inflation that carries these two points apart, but at that point the, uh, the matter was already thermalized. So, <coughs> So now uh, we have this, uh, this other phenomenon that, uh, that you know, that you have already saw. We have uh, 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 people start looking to supernova, that is a, a new candle that allows measurement of the distance uh, with precision but very far away. So they can, the, the peak uh, of brightness of the supernova is standardized with 10% accuracy, so you can do very precise measurements. And uh, then you have instruments that allow you to measure millions of gal galaxies and to look for supernova and uh, with powerful instruments that can do that with computers and so on. This is a picture from Hubble. Uh, here you have 10,000 galax galaxies and this corresponds to one tenth sites of the moon. So this corresponds to a tiny fraction of, uh, of uh, the, the, s the angular space. And uh, so this is uh, the measurement uh, that uh, was already presented by Seth. So the, the, uh, the uh, it's, a, it's a measurement done by two groups independently uh, in 1998. They got the same result. The universe expansion is accelerating. Is accelerating. So this is uh, these points here that are on the curve that is above the uh, that shows that the universe is accelerating. If the universe is accelerating in some form of energy. Dark energy fills the space. So here comes then the X. Now I come back to <laughs> the things that I know better. Um, now the idea is that <coughs> suppose that I have a field, a X, a X like field. It cannot, could not be, or possibly it is not the field, the X field responsible for the electroweak unification. But now I have a more generic look into this question and I imagine that at the beginning there was a field with these characteristics. And it's of the type of field I have shown you to for, for the X. I have here a, a small region of uh, where I can have what is called a false vacuum. So I can have the universe trapped here in this, in this point and then they're going what is called a super cooling transition. That means that the temperature decreases below the phase transition point, but the X field stays in here in the false, in the false vacuum. And during that, that uh, the, the time this occurs, we have the inflation, because during that time, I have a positive uh, energy density in the universe that is just the energy of the X field. And then later on, when the energy density, uh, so this is what I said, when energy of the field is positive, the universe expands at an accelerated rate. So this is the equivalent of the cosmological, the effect of the cosmological constant of Einstein. And uh, the energy stored in the, in the X field increases, because if the energy is a constant here, is a density, is energy per unit of volume, I increase the volume, I increase the energy. So I'm creating the energy. So the energy on the X field increases. At some point, the inflation stops, the, the X field transits to the lowest level, to this real vacuum that we have now, to one of these points in this uh, circumference, and the energy that is released by the X field is convert, converted into matter particles. So this is in a few words, what people have imagined as a scenario for the inflation. So it has this aspect of uh, solving two problems of cosmology. And if we are a bit courageous, we can imagine that all the matter in the universe was also produced through this mechanism, through the energy that is accumulated in the Higgs field at some point is transformed in all matter that creates the universe. So um, what I sh 
can say about this is that we need to know much more about the current field that or the current energy potential that we can measure in the lab. We can, uh, in the next, uh, say, 10 years or so, we can measure this type of shape. We can know what is the shape of the potential of the X field responsible for the electroweak interaction. And knowing that is very precious information to eventually extrapolate to this model of, uh, of the inflation. So very quickly in the last 10 minutes, the, uh, a few words about what we could see at, at LHC. So we know that we have this uh, very nice standard model. Uh, it is a proof of the astonishing brain power of a certain ape species. Uh, this incredible agreement between the mass of the W, mass of the top, mass of the X that I have uh, shown to you. I have hope today told you that we have this uh, huge problem with the X mass and these miraculous cancellations. And here we are at, at the crossroads. Either nature chose what we call naturalness, that is a physics that naturally cancels these uh, terms, and this could be supersymmetry, but could be also other, other models. There are several possibilities that go into the side of naturalness, or we can go into the branch of the uh, multiverse that also set introduced. That means this is the concept that we are just in one out of zillions of uh, other universes with different properties, and we are just in this one where this miraculous cancellation occurred. So that's why we are here. I don't believe. So I still believe that we should go that way, and that's why um, uh, people continue to, to search for these uh, new signs of new physics at LHC very hard. Now, if we take this argument of the naturalness, if we don't want fine-tuning, if we, we want uh, uh, something to, to show up that cancels these terms, be it SUSY, supersymmetry or any other symmetry or some other new physics that we didn't imagine yet, it should occur, if the X is 125, it should occur at a, at a scale of the order below 2 TV. And this is accessible at LHC. So this path of naturalness can be tested by LHC. This is... Uh, now, which the theory will do this cancellation or which physics, will, which model will show up we don't know. There are many, many possibilities. I've told you about supersymmetry, extra dimensions, but there are others. There are well, I told also about uh, grand unified theories and leptoquarks. Uh, there is technicolor. There are some models of compulsiveness. So we have to, to do the experiment and see if something happens. Uh, if it is supersymmetry, we are looking to process like this. So two here there are two gluins produced and then they produce a cascade of decays and one of the characteristics of these uh, decays is that they end up always with these chi uh, particles here that are, that are called neutralinos and these neutralinos do not decay, they are supersymmetric particles, they do, they do not decay, they are probably heavy, they are stable, they are uh, weakly interacting and these are the, are the candidates for dark, marker, dark matter particles. So we call them the LSP, the lightest supersymmetric particle. They cannot decay to lightest thing because there is a conserving uh, uh, quantum number conserved in SUSY that is R parity that prevents these objects to decay. So we are looking to essentially events where we have missing energy, lots of missing energy in the detector not energy that doesn't balance with the other particles in the event because these objects escape without being detected. We have been search for the, searching for that, for these particles. This is a long list of uh, particles searched. You see gluinos, you see stops, you see uh, in different processes. And this is the region of exclusion. So we have ex uh, this is uh, mass. Here is one TV. So we have excluded the number of cases up to 1 TV, in other cases up to 500 GV. So I have told you that up to 2 GV is still okay, so we have still a way to go to cover all this. So there is still hope. Now apart from SUSY, these are all the types of models that have been tested at LHC. 
Uh, so each one of these lines is a particular model. So they have grouped these in categories. Uh, so these are new resonances, new type of uh, heavy particles. This is composite, uh, composite models. This is uh, the idea that a force generation could exist, even if it is very unlikely. Uh, Long-lived particles, uh, new uh, known particles, leptoquarks, uh, contact interaction, and also black holes. So all these, these bars represent excluded regions. And these one, two, three, four are TV. So this means that, for example, those ones have been excluded up to around one TV. So. Um, this is where we are. Uh, these are the projections for, for LHC. So we have, uh, the program is very long. It goes up to 2023, where this uh, uh, LS1, LS2, LS3 means long shutdown, one, two, three. We are now in the long shutdown one. So we have done the ATV run up to the end of 2012 with eight TV uh, in, the, uh, in the machine. And uh, we'll go to higher energy after, uh, at the beginning of 2015, increasing the luminosity to have uh, access to more rare ev events. And we are upgrading the detectors and the machine to do, to do this. So uh, we are just, this is to say that we are just at the beginning. So the fact that we have discovered already the X is very good. And uh, the fact that nothing else have uh, is was, uh, was discovered is not uh, so discouraging. So the program was foreseen uh, for all this time up to that point. And there is still a phase that is being uh, now proposed to extend this for 10 more years at very high, high luminosity. This HL is very high luminosity at 14 TV. So going up to 2030. So I finish this uh, lecture um, with uh, just what, are, what, what is my view of the major outstanding problems in quantum physics. This is a list uh, that uh, many people share, others don't, but this is my view. I th these are the problems that uh, for, it's not for the next 10 years, it's not for LHC, it's for not the next centuries. So this mass hierarchy problem that I have described in detail, so maybe it will be solved uh, quickly, we hope, if something is discovered at LHC. Explain dark matter and dark energy. If uh, these neutralinos are or something similar are discovered, we have an explanation for dark matter, so uh, this could be answered soon. Dark energy, I think that it will take decades to, to answer, what to discover, to understand what is this dark energy. Grand unification of particle and forces, this unification of electro, electro weak and strong force, I think that this will require, it will require uh, uh, machines with much higher energy, new technologies that will allow big factors of gain in energy. It's very difficult to extrapolate by many orders of magnitude from what we measure here at small energy to very, very big energy. So I think that we need more information, more measurements. So this will take decades, if not, not a century. And, uh, and then there are these very complicated problems. Combine general relativity with quantum theory in a single theory. Solve the fundamental problems of quantum mechanics. Understand why we don't understand quantum mechanics. And uh, explain the values of const constants in nature. Explain why wh we are in an universe where if I change the electrical charge of the electron by some amount, atoms are not possible and the universe will not exist as, as we know it. So explain the values of constants of nature. So we have work to do. Thank you very much. I would like, before leaving, to do two things. The first one is to acknowledge a number of people that helped me in collecting material and giving ideas for these, uh, for these uh, talks. I've put some effort on that. I hope that, uh, that, that you got something and that you uh, are happy. I am very happy and I have to give you a big thank you to all of you for uh, all the inspiring questions, conversations and attention to, to the lectures that you have put. Thank you very much.